Hey folks, so welcome to this lecture on recombination and transposition of DNA from the Molecular Genetics module, University of Bradford. Um, so, as you can see, this is maize, sweet corn, as we call it here in the UK. Uh, the reason that I've got this on a slide, <coughs> well, isn't because I like sweet corn, I do like sweet corn, but maize has played a really important role in our understanding of dna transposition through the work of someone called barbara mcclintock the 1950s who effectively discovered transposable elements jumping genes as they're also known through her work on maize and she won the nobel prize for this work um, and really it was the first examples of mobile genetic elements being present in chromosomes this concept that um, the order of chromosomes isn't actually linear and constant and things can be rearranged and moved around uh, and we now know that one of the things that's responsible for moving those genomic elements around are transposons and the other event which can also lead to changes in the order of dna in our chromosomes is recombination and we're going to be considering both of those things relatively briefly during this lecture so the outline of the lecture then is to introduce you to homologous recombination uh, and really to go over the major events which are associated with this process which are strand invasion and then the formation and resolution of these so-called holiday junctions we'll talk a little bit about then the recombination machinery that carries out these processes before moving on to an overview of transposons and i know that you have had some information already on bacterial transposons in this module but we're going to be focusing today on transposable elements which are exclusive to higher order systems such as humans and including humans such as lines and signs uh, allo repeats etc and how these elements um, self-replicate and move around the genome so we'll be discussing the different types of transposition events uh, focusing particularly on these transposable elements that look quite similar actually to protein coding genes um, focusing on lines as an example of one of those if you like uh, eukaryotic specific um, transposable elements and finishing with an example of how evolution's co-opted transposition as a mechanism to enable the generation of antibodies in b cells as part of the adaptive immune response so your learning objectives for this lecture really are threefold Understand how homologous recombination occurs and the complexes that are involved. In particular, understand the stepwise nature of homologous recombination, the events that are required in order to drive that event forward. Um, to develop your knowledge a little further in terms of transposable elements and transposition events, in particular these um, complex gene-like transposable elements which can um, self-replicate and uh, integrate around the genome and drive the integration of other less complex transposable elements and finally have an understanding of how transposition facilitates vdj recombination but it's the first two points really that are the major things you want to make sure you understand how homologous recombination is occurring and then how these eukaryotic these human transposable elements move around our genome and you helped in this again by two excellent chapters uh, both in Brooker, chapter 17, which deals with this uh, lecture topic in its entirety. And then the, um, if you want something a bit more detailed, a bit more advanced, you can look at the Watson et al. Molecular Biology of the Gene textbook. Um, and this discusses homologous recombination and double strand break repair in chapter 11, um, followed by transposition events in chapter 12. And that includes um, prokaryotic transposons as well as the transposons I'm going to talk about today. Okay then, so one thing that is universally true in terms of homologous recombination is that it's always preceded by the appearance of double strand breaks. So what we have here is a immunofluorescent image of a cell. So this cell has been stained with um, two different antibody markers. An antibody marker which looks as though it's lighting up the cell membrane, membranous structures. Uh, and then a second antibody in panel B which is detecting double strand breaks. Um, the blue stain being DAPID, so that's a counter stain for DNA. So these two cells have been treated differently. The first cell, the cell on the left in panel A, is untreated, and panel B has been treated with gamma radiation. So as you'll know from our DNA damage and repair lecture, gamma radiation is a 
potent inducer of double strand breaks and the punctate green staining that you can see here in this particular cell represents staining of a particular protein known as histone 2AX um, and specifically the phosphorylated form of that histone 2AX protein which is a useful marker for the presence of double strand breaks. So why then are double strand breaks required for homologous recombination to begin? So let's have a think about what's actually going on when we have a double strand break event occur in the DNA. So there are a number of reasons why double strand breaks occur in our DNA, uh, but probably the major reason um, they occur is due to DNA replication errors. So if you imagine a situation occurring during DNA replication, whereby the replication fork is moving forward and replicating parental DNA, at which point it encounters perhaps a nick in that DNA template, such as we've got here, the consequence of this is for this to produce a double strand break in one of the two replicated double stranded DNA molecules. And as soon as a cell detects this double strand break, then it necessitates um, repair. Uh, that repair can occur via two mechanisms. It can occur via non-homologous end joining, which is a mechanism we discussed during our DNA damage and repair lecture, or it can be repaired via homologous recombination. There's a second way in which DNA replication can give rise to double strand breaks, and that's by something called a collapsed replication fork and fork regression. So this occurs where a lesion is present in the DNA template strand that the replication fork hits, and hitting this lesion causes the fork to collapse and sometimes invert back inwards on itself, which can lead to the formation again of a double strand break. So if you imagine this structure here, this is will be will be detected as a double strand break by the cell that would require resolution and repair. Now there's another major use of homologous recombination which we're not going to talk about in great detail today, and that is during meiosis. So all DNA is recombine, recombined DNA to a certain extent, uh, and that recombination of DNA in eukaryotes takes place during. Uh, meiosis. So it's during the productive cell division that occurs when you have gametes come together um, and interestingly there are proteins, meiotic proteins, which are only expressed during meiosis who actually in, which actually induce, specifically and intentionally induce lots and lots of double strand breaks in the DNA for the sole reason of facilitating homologous recombination and crossover events during meiotic division. So why are these double strand breaks required then why are they needed as a precursor for homologous recombination so let's consider a double strand break um, in, in below in this in this cartoon below so we've got a double strand break event which has occurred in one of the two um, chromosomes here and we also have then the different alleles of these two chromosomes for specific um, uh, genes and these alleles are different depending on which chromosome we're looking at yeah, so here the allele is represented by capital A here, lowercase a, so the classic Mendelian nomenclature. Think a little bit though about what this actually means. You know, allele A is more or less identical genetically, so it's the same gene, it's just a different variant of that gene. So it may differ by a few nucleotides, but it's largely going to be identical. So there's going to be large regions of homology between uh, the, the upper allele and the lower allele on these two chromosomes. So once a double strand break event occurs above, what it does initially is it initiates recombination. So the double strand break permits one of the two DNA strands near the break to peel away from its complementary strand, thus creating a double, sorry, thus creating a single stranded piece of DNA that can then invade and base pair with the other chromosome, as shown in this figure below. So here initially we've got resection. Of one of the two strands of DNA on the chromosome where the double strand break has occurred so it gives us a region of single stranded DNA and then this single stranded DNA is able to invade into the homologous chromosome and use the information in the homologous chromosome to drive repair of the double strand break event. Now when this invasion occurs, this strand invasion occurs, 
we get formation of a special type of structure called a holiday junction. And this is represented here by this crossover event between the two chromatids from the different chromosomes. Following primary strand invasion, first strand invasion, the holiday junction then begins to move along the chromosome. And the distance that the holiday junction moves, that determines the amount of DNA that's going to be exchanged between those two chromosomes. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that when this exchange is taking place, it might be that the information that's been copied between those two chromosomes differs somewhat. There are small differences present in the sequence that's due to the fact that the alleles are different on those two chromosomes at particular points. So that's highlighted here by allele B, where we have a crossover event which has brought together large B and small B on one of the repaired chromosomes. And if you think about what's going on here at the nucleotide level between these two um, chromatids, these two annealed regions of the chromosome, what you're actually having occur is a mismatch between, at certain points between these two alleles. The vast majority of sequence is going to be the same, but they are going to be small regions of sequence dissimilarity, and that will lead to a mismatch occurring between those two nucleotides in that heteroduplex region of DNA. So what's the consequence then of forming these small regions of mismatch in the heteroduplex? Well, we'll consider that in a few slides. So before we get on to that, I want you to have a little bit of a think about holiday junctions and how these might be resolved following formation. So these are somewhat complex structures that I find quite hard to visualize. Uh, I always remember that when I was doing my degree, we had to kind of construct artificially these chromosomes. Uh, from different coloured plasticine or modelling clay uh, with a view to trying to get to grips with the three-dimensional nature of chromosomes and how they cross over and interact. But I think it's quite useful if you look at this particular representation of a holiday junction and a crossover event here where the chromosomes have been twisted, been rotated in this plane so that they no longer uh, no longer have any crossing strands. And this kind of enables you to see the two possibilities in terms of resolution. In effect, when this holiday junction is resolved, cut, for want of a better term, you can either resolve the cut this way, or you can resolve the cut that way to reconstitute the two separate chromosomes. And depending on which cut you opt for, you are going to generate different chromosomal structures with different crossover events. So the holiday junction was first described by this guy, Rafferty, in the 90s. And it nicely shows this GIF, I think, the, how the holiday junction can move to generate an exchange of, new, uh, uh, of DNA during migration of that holiday junction uh, and homologous recombination and homologous recombination. So as I said, there are two possibilities when a holiday junction is resolved. So one rule, which must be adhered to, is that you must resolve strands with the same sequence and polar polarity during the cut. So if you don't do that, then you're not going to be able to reconstitute the chromosome correctly. But there are two ways in which that can be achieved. The first generates what's known as splice products, also known as crossover products, and the second generates what's known as patched products, um, so-called because you kind of introduce this patch of different sequences as a crossover event. So these are represented in these two images here. So imagine the holiday junction that we have here with the different alleles, some of which have been generated due to crossover. If we now resolve this holiday junction in the vertical axis, you generate two chromosomes with the following reassortment of alleles. This is the crossover or splice variant. If you were to resolve this holiday junction in the horizontal axis, then you generate very different reassortment of chromosomes and you generate what's known as this patch or non-crossover product. So if you want to do a little bit of additional reading in terms of holiday junctions and resolutions, there are more complex examples in the molecular biology of the gene book where you introduce additional alleles and look at more complex holiday junction resolutions and what kind of crossover events you can, you can obtain. So feel free to have a read about that. But the main thing really to take away from this is that for following formation of a holiday, holiday junction, you will generate different types of chromosomes depending on how you choose to resolve that junction.
the crossover. So the vast majority of our understanding in terms of what machinery is actually carrying out this uh, crossover event is derived from uh, E. coli, working in bacteria, like many of the molecular mechanisms. It turns out actually that most of the proteins which are used by bacteria to handle crossover uh, homologous recombination um, are highly conserved through to, through to eukaryotes and humans. So double strand breaks are very dangerous for bacteria as they are for, for our cells. Uh, a single double strand break in E. coli is lethal to the cell if the cell doesn't have the capacity to repair that damage. Um, so homologous recombination in E. coli is very much a mechanism for double strand break repair. Obviously E. coli doesn't undergo meiosis. However, the proteins involved in that repair, as I've said, in E. coli are very similar in nature to the proteins involved in our cells. So we have a list of proteins here involved in the induction and um, processing of double strand break repair and homologous recombination. As I've said, obviously E. coli doesn't undergo meiosis, so there is no protein in E. coli to generate double strand breaks. In um, eukaryotic cells, this process is carried out by SPO11 which at the start of meiosis will induce lots of double strand breaks to drive recombination. But many of the other proteins which are conserved from E. coli are present in, uh, in eukaryotic systems, such as those that are involved in uh, promoting strand exchange and resolution of holiday junctions. So if you recall from a few slides ago, we talked about what can happen when you have regions of um, dissimilarity between two chromosomes due to different alleles. And I said we'd come back to that later on. And, well, this is what we're going to consider now on this slide. So gene conversion is the phenomenon whereby a particular allele of a gene is lost and replaced by a different allele during meiosis. So if you consider the example here in this box, classic Mendelian genetics, tells us that when we get dissociation of these alleles, each of the um, gametes will carry either large A or small A. However, there is a phenomenon known as gene conversion where we sometimes observe that rather than this dissociation of alleles being even, we end up with three large A's and, and one small A or three small A's and one large A. So how is this occurring? Well, it's occurring due to this phenomena of heteroduplex formation. So if you think about what's actually going on during heteroduplex formation is you're getting the formation of a mismatch between the two paired chromosomes here. Now from our electron DNA repair earlier in the module we know that when we get a mismatch between two strands of DNA there is the mismatch repair system which will come along and correct this error. And that's exactly what goes on here during meiosis. We get conversion of one of these two alleles to represent the other allele by the mismatch repair system. And the consequence of this is a conversion of one of the large B alleles or one of the large small B alleles into the other allele, giving us a 3 to 1 ratio instead of the predicted 2 to 2 ratio that we would expect. So this is exemplified better in this cartoon here. So here we have the events that are undergoing recombination, the parental molecules. Migration of holiday junctions led to the formation of heteroduplex DNA, where we've now got regions of the same gene from different chromosomes that have different alleles of that gene opposite one another. And that's caused a mismatch to occur due to small regions of sequence dissimilarity. That mismatch is repaired by the mismatch repair system, which during meiosis effectively chooses at random which of the mismatches to excise and repair. And depending on which it chooses, you end up with one or the other gene conversion events, three large A's, small A, or three small A's, one large A. So I've really gone over very quickly there, homologous recombination. It's a huge topic and I'd advise you to look at the recommended textbooks uh, in your own time and uh, there's, there's a lot more information there in terms of um, in terms of the process and holiday junction resolution, etc. But I want to move on now to transposition of DNA. So Dr. Pix has already introduced transposons to you earlier this semester. 
but I want to talk today specifically about eukaryotic transposition um, but just to reiterate brief, very briefly uh, what transposition is transposition of DNA is very important for several reasons not least because it's a major source of spontaneous mutation in our genomes it's also very important and interesting in human genomes from an evolutionary perspective as so much of our genomes actually comprised of these repeat sequences now essentially transposition can be thought of in one of two ways uh, this is a convenient analogy cut and paste and copy and paste control um, uh, control c control v or control um, x control v cut paste or copy paste now transposition events are relatively rare in our genomes and most of the time when they do occur they don't have any deleterious effect but obviously if a transposable element jumps into a region of the genome that contains uh, essential genes then bad things can happen genes can be disrupted or over hyperactivated in the case of proto-oncogenes and that can lead to mutation and disease so as we saw in the previous lecture on genome organization um, transposable elements these repeat sequences make up a very large area and amount of our of our genomic real estate so if we look at the examples below we've got maize here so Barbara McClintock's model organism huge amounts of repeat elements present in this organism which is what made it such a great system for studying uh, this process initially that and the fact that you have effectively hundreds of offspring all visible on the comb itself every kernel is is a is a result of a different um, productive event so it's a very great good organism for spotting mutations that arise during um, during uh, meiosis um, next on the list we've got humans so humans again they've got a large amount of repeat sequence present within their genomes uh, and as we go down the um, if you like evolutionary scale towards more simple organisms invertebrates and then simple single cellular eukaryotes have got decreasing amounts of these repeat elements and E. coli have got very few um, of these transposable repeat elements in their genomes so clearly we have a lot of them most of them are, most of them are dormant but what are they where do they come from and how do they, how do they replicate so proficiently across our, our genomic real estate so I want to focus really today on a couple of examples uh, that are important to humans um, but just initially I want to remind you about the different broad types of uh, transposition events that can occur in our, in our genomes um, and these are you know loosely grouped into the following different types so we have DNA transposition events we can have virus like transposition or retrovirus transposition events and we have these so-called poly A retrotransposons which are really interesting and we're going to focus on in more detail uh, in a moment's time so in the case of DNA transposons what you have generally is uh, an element within the genome that contains a gene called transposase or sometimes it's known as integrase uh, and this gene encodes for a protein product which is capable of integrating the entire element elsewhere in the genome so integration into the genome occurs via these terminal inverted repeat sequences here so these terminal inverted repeat sequences interact with other regions of the genome in combination with the integrase or transposase protein to effectively copy and move this element elsewhere in, in that particular cell's um, genomic DNA virus like retrotransposons are slightly more complex and mimic uh, retro uh, viruses to a certain extent obviously with a retrovirus when the virus infects a cell it undergoes replication <coughs> of its genome which is not dissimilar to the, this element here just a little bit more complex but importantly that retrovirus genome will eventually be packaged into virus capsid and the virus then will be uh, released from the cell uh, where it can go about the business of infecting other cells and propagating the virus Retrotransposons, retrotransposons whilst they replicate in a similar manner to uh, retroviruses never leave the cell from which they're in which they're located they're only capable of moving this element around the genomic DNA they can never escape that cell um, and uh, and deliver you know uh, elements to to other to other cells they're kind of trapped within a single cell cell context 
Um, how do they move around then? Well, they move around by virtue of a clever protein, which they express, which has got the same kind of transpose stroke integrase properties as the element we've just been talking about here. But it's also got this very important property of reverse transcriptase capability. So what that means is that we have a protein which is able to not only um, integrate this retrotransposome element by virtue of these long terminal repeat sequences elsewhere in the genome, it's also able to produce DNA from a messenger RNA um, transcript of this element so that that DNA can then be reintegrated into the, into the genomic sequence um, directly. And it's this uh, re re reverse transcriptase property which um, you know gives these transposons their name of retro transposons. Retro due to the fact that um, they're operated in reverse of the central dogma. So obviously the central dogma being DNA makes RNA makes protein. Well, these retro transposons take RNA and make DNA via virtue of this reverse transcriptase enzyme. The poly A retro transposons here at the bottom. Well, these are very interesting. These encode two upper reading frames, ORF1 and ORF2. Uh, both of these ORF1 reading frames are very important in terms of function. The first is an RNA binding protein, and the second is a multifunctional protein that itself has reverse transcriptase activity and also endonuclease activity, so it can cut DNA and also reverse transcribe RNA into DNA. You'll see that the structure is very different in the polyeritrotransposons. In fact, it looks very much like a gene. It has a 5' untranslated region, a 3' untranslated region, and actually a poly A region, similar to the poly A regions you find on eukaryotic messenger RNAs. And it also has these uh, target site duplication regions, uh, which it can use to um, promote integration into other sites of the genome, although integration tends to occur at poly T sites present in the genome, as we'll see in a moment. So the copy-paste mechanisms for the DNA-like transposons are similar in eukaryotes to what Dr. Pixley will have told you about already in bacterial cells. So I don't want to go over those. I want to focus instead on this so-called target site primed reverse transcriptase system here, uh, which is what the poly-A um, transposons utilize when they move around genomes. And you can see here the example that we're using is for lines, long interspersed um, uh, DNA repeat sequences, which are very common sequences in humans. And we'll give some specific examples of lines and their simpler cousin signs uh, on the next slide. But first, I just want to talk you through how this actually works when uh, this transposition event occurs. So what you get is initially transcription of the entire line retrotransposon um, poly A sequence, generally via transcription using RNA polymerase 2. So the same RNA polymerase which, which transcribes genes will recognize a promoter sequence found in the 5' UTR of the line and transcribe the entire section here as effectively a messenger RNA. So this messenger RNA, like normal cellular messenger RNAs, contains a 5' UTR, a 3' UTR and a poly A tail. So because it looks like a normal messenger RNA, it's exported out of the cytoplasm via the same mechanisms we discussed in the gene expression lecture, um, where it's then translated into protein. And as we know, this particular messenger RNA has two open reading frames which are translated into protein, ORF1 and ORF2. ORF1 and ORF2 interact with one another, and ORF1 in particular is important because it's an RNA binding protein. And the RNA which ORF1 binds to is the RNA from which it is transcribed. So this is a really, really clever mechanism. What it means is following translation of this messenger RNA and ORF1, the ORF1 gene product which is produced immediately recognises and binds to the messenger RNA which gave rise to its translation in association with the ORF2 protein. This complex of ORF1 and ORF2 is then re-localised uh, into the nucleus where it binds to target DNA. And as we discussed earlier on the previous slide, target insertion sites tend to be centred or more efficiently um, localised around uh, poly T regions because of the poly A region found within this messenger RNA. So remember, ORF2 has an endonuclease activity, so it can nick and cause a cut in this target site DNA here, enabling the integration of this messenger RNA molecule whilst it's still associated with ORF1 and ORF2. 
and then in a, in, a, in a mechanism that we still don't really fully understand RNA DNA cleavage occurs and the hybrid formation uh, of this RNA and DNA um, is set up which enables then of 2 which also has reverse transcriptase activity to reverse transcribe cDNA for the line using the 3 prime OH of the integrated messenger RNA here in the primer. Following first strand synthesis of the cDNA copy, a second copy is produced and then these two double stranded cDNAs are then integrated fully into the target sequence in the DNA which is joined and repaired via ligation using ligase and what you end up with then is a another integrated copy of the line DNA in the genome. So a little bit of a complex mechanism. This is in the Watson and Crick uh, Molecular Biology of the Gene book if you want to read about it in more detail. But it's a really elegant mechanism for copying and then reinserting a line sequence elsewhere in the DNA. And it's this mechanism which has been basically utilised over many millions of years in our genomes uh, many certainly many tens of thousands of years in our genomes uh, and give rise to such a large proportion of these repeat elements within our DNA. So we know that nearly half the DNA is comprised of these um, if you like ju these junk um, elements but 20% a fifth of our genomes comprised just of these long interspersed nuclear elements these lines. Uh, by far the most prevalent and well studied line in humans is the L1 line uh, and L1 lines are, and lines in general are known as autonomous polyurethrotransposons. So autonomous because they contain everything within themselves that's required in order to transpose their information elsewhere in the genome. Now autonomous lines also function to move and transpose around uh, non-autonomous uh, polyurethrotransposons which are known in humans as short interspersed nuclear elements or signs. So signs, unlike lines, lack the clever ORF1, ORF2 protein machinery required to do all of that trickery in terms of inserting these sequences back into the genome following transcription and instead just contain the target integration sites present for these, um, for these transposons. So these elements require the activity of the line and it's off one off two in order to actually reinsert themselves elsewhere in the genome so the, the model is that uh, the signs would be uh, exported translated uh, would be transcribed initially by RNA polymerase the messenger RNA will be exported into the cytoplasm where off one off two from lines would associate with it and then reintegrate it back into the genome so all of this is very clever um, Obviously, transposition events are dangerous, they introduce mutation. Mutation can be good in terms of evolution, but generally speaking, it's a big source of spontaneous mutation disease. However, VDJ recombination gives us a really, really excellent example of how, uh, over time, evolution in the cell and organisms have co opted, if you like, a parasitic movement of DNA around the genomes in order to evolve a really elegantly and, you know, mind bogglingly complex system. Uh, which we utilize for adaptive immune response in, in, in our cells. So the VDJ system, which you, show, you may have encountered already in other modules, is a mechanism for generating the adaptive immune response in vertebrates. So in vertebrates, the immune response requires production of T cell receptor antibodies that are capable of recognizing diverse rays of antigens. These uh, antibodies are generated in B cells and they're generated via recombination events effectively. Um, between different regions of this VDJ um, system. So as you'll be aware, I'm sure, antibodies are generally comprised of variable and constant regions, heavy and light chains. It's the variable region of the antibody that's the clever bit and the bit that recognises all these different antigens. So how on earth do you construct variable regions of antibodies with enough diversity to recognise a potentially, you know, almost if not infinite certainly very very vast range of potential antigens well the answer is by co-opting the sorts of re reorganization and recombination that retrotransposons can achieve um, and the, this is done via something called the rag 1 2 complex so effectively during b cell development different segments of the vda system are stitched together 
by mechanisms very similar to what DNA transposition uh, events utilize. Um, and the upshot of this is that the VDJ system is capable of generating around 3 times 10 to the 11 antibody variations, which is a mind-bogglingly large number uh, and gives the system the potential to recognize and specifically uh, uh, bind to such a diverse range uh, of antigens. So just to summarize, then we've very quickly really gone through uh, different aspects of homologous recombination, talked about strand invasion and holiday junctions as key elements of homologous recombination. Resolution of holiday junctions <coughs> determines the types of, the, of recombination that's produced. So you can have crossover events or spliced events, or you can equally have patch resolution, which gives you a different type of um, recombination event. And this can be a little confusing, and it's dependent upon the plane in which that holiday junction is resolved. Uh, one interesting aspect of homologous recombination is the potential to drive gene conversion events. And this occurs, remember, when mismatches arise due to uh, holiday junctions migrating and bringing together different alleles of the same gene, which have micro regions of dissimilarity in terms of sequence, that the mismatch repair system then tends to repair one way or the other, driving us towards a 3 to 1 ratio of alleles rather than the expected 2 to 2 ratio of dominant and recessive, if you like, when you use that language, uh, alleles that you would expect from a meiotic recombination. We then went on to talk about transposition as a major source of um, DNA mutation. Um, we talked in length about transposable elements that make up large parts of the human genome, in particular the L1 line and how that manages to copy itself by virtue of utilising RNA polymerase 2 transcription machinery before very cleverly reinserting that transcribed messenger RNA by virtue of an endonuclease and integrase stroke reverse transcriptase activity of the OF2 protein from L1. We also talked about how L1 lines are capable of also integrating the non-autonomous um, signs um, in, in our genome. One of the most prevalent elements in the entire genome is a, a repeat element called the ALU repeat, which is a sign element, which over history has been incorporated in our genome and expanded throughout our genome by virtue of these autonomous lines, these L1 lines and other autonomous lines, assisting in its integration and expansion over the ages. And we finished by just discussing how many of these transposition mechanisms, or some of these transposition mechanisms, sorry, have evolved into real key molecular processes, such as VDJ recombination, which is the essential process of antibody generation in B cells as part of the adaptive immune response. So I hope this kind of whistle-top store of the um, homologous recombination and transposable elements lecture is useful for, uh, during your revision. Um, there are, as I've said, excellent chapters in both core textbooks for this material, so I would urge you, in conjunction with this podcast and the lecture slides, to look at that material and um, take on board some of the additional detail that that, that that gives you. Okay, thank you very much for your attention, and um, I'll see you in, an, in another podcast.